ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وسلم continue on in our study of kitab al nikah in bulugh al maram we reach the 829th hadith the hadith of abdullah bin mas'ud radiyallahu ta'ala an narrated abdullah bin mas'ud radiyallahu ta'ala an Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us a tashahhud in case of some need, which is praise is due to Allah whom we praise and from whom we ask help and forgiveness. We seek refuge in Allah from the evils of ourselves. He whom Allah guides, no one who can lead him astray. And he whom he leads astray has no one to guide him. I testify that there is nothing deserving of worship except Allah. And I testify that Muhammad is his slave and messenger. He then recites three verses reported by Ahmed, Al Arba, Al Tirmidhi, and Al Hakam graded it as good. In this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, the hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala an, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught his sahaba the khutbah tahaja, what is known as khutbah tahaja. And this khutbah tahaja is known as khutbah uh, tahajjah because it is something which is read for some great need, for something that's great. For example, the khutbah, what is most commonly known, we know this in the khutbah. And the reason Imam al-Asqalani, Imam uh, Ibn Hajr, Rahimahullah Ta'ala mentioned this in the Kitab and Nikah is due to the importance of the uh, of, of the marital bond and that the Khutbah Tahaja is also recited uh, during the marital bond, during the nikah. And we'll talk about the hukum as we progress through the hadith. So, Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala, he said, Allamana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught them. At tashahhud. And here, Bin Uthaymeen mentions a great faida as far as when he says a tashahhud and that here and we'll get to this more in the 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 benefits of this but that sometimes you find alfaz or um uh, term terms in the sharia that have names which are interchangeable and due to the importance of the tashahhud and that is an important part of this khutbah tahaja that the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala an, radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'een, like Ibn uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala an, mentioned and referred to it as a tashahud. He didn't say khutbah tahaja, what we are normally accustomed to saying, the khutbah, khutbah tahaja. But rather he said, Allamana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a tashahud. That the Prophet وسلم, taught us the tashahhud for 
uh, a haja or for a necessity. The tashahud in case of some need. And then he recited this or he narrated this uh, supplication, this khutbah, which is, is known in Alhamdulillah, which means all praises belongs to Allah, Nahmaduhu. And this is an affirmation that we praise Him. So all the praise belongs to Allah and we praise Him, praise Him, Nahmaduhu. Uh, and we seek His assistance. And we seek forgiveness from Him. وَنَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ شُرُورِ أَنفُسِنَا And we seek refuge in Allah from our wicked selves. Letting us know what? That we contain both good and bad. Without doubt we commit sin, as we've said countless times. The Prophet ﷺ said, "Kullu ibn Adam khatta, wa khayran khatayin tawabun." All the children of Adam make mistakes or commit sins, and the best of those who sin are those who repent. And then the Prophet ﷺ said in the khutbah, he said, "Min yahdi Allahu fala mudilla." He said, "And whoever Allah guides." then no one can lead him astray. And whoever is led astray or misguided, then there's no guidance for him. So the Hidayah is in the hands of Allah The ultimate Hidayah. This is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's Qadr. And this is from the Tawfiq for, uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you receive guidance. If you receive guidance to the Suratullahi al mustaqim this is from Allah Azza wa Jal. And then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as narrated by Ibn um, uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala, wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah. And I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship. Illallah, except Allah, except Allah. So this is Tawheed, is affirmed there. Uh, this is the Rububiyyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lordship of Allah Azza wa Jal. Likewise, in this supplication, in this khutbah tahajjah, when we say, wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah, this constitutes two, two things here. Uh, affirmation or ithbat wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu an la ilaha so this is a, a nafi this is the negation of all false gods and if we were to stop there in this khutbah al hajj in this in this when we bear the testimony of faith then that would have a meaning a facet meaning, a wicked meaning. You wouldn't stop there. You wouldn't say, You wouldn't say that. Because there you're negating that there is a God. Period. But then, when the harf al illa, when we say illa, this is istithna, uh, or this is the exception. Illallah. That means now you're making an affirmation. You're affirming that there is a God. There is one God. There is the only God worthy of worship. And that is Allah So that statement, just that part of the Khutbah al Hajjah contains both negation, negation of false gods, or affirmation of Allah Abduhu, <clears throat> Abduhu wa Rasuluh. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is, a slave in, uh, is his slave and messenger. And then he said, وَيَقْرَى ثَلَاثَ ayat. And then he read three ayat. And those are the ayat that we're familiar with and we're not going to 
uh, read those ayats for the sake of time. However, in this hadith, there are immense benefits and immense fuaid we could talk about, and it would lengthen our discussion of this hadith. Uh, you, you, in fact, there are books written just about this hadith, just explaining the khutbah al hajjah So this shows us the immense benefits uh, that it, uh, because it contains so many uh, aspects of tawheed. And it is the asking for blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the praising of Allah Azza wa Jal. It contains his rububiyyah. You know, the, the, the lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is contained in there. Meaning that this hadith illustrates a rububiyyah. Likewise, tawheed al-uluhiyah or what is known as tawheed uh, al-ibadah meaning the Tawheed or the monotheism of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone because in this hadith the one making the khutbah al hajjah the one saying it is seeking forgiveness from Allah is seeking refuge in Allah from their evil selves they are seeking uh, the assistance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa nasta'inu wa nasta'afru all of these things are a way of asking your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala, which means this is Tawheed al uluhiyah or Tawheed al-Ibadah, because this is an action that you are doing to worship Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Whereas Tawheed al rububiyyah has to do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself being the Lord of everything, being the creator and the sustainer of everything. So this hadith contains both of those, uh, both of those aspects of Tawheed, Tawheed al uluhiya and Tawheed al rububiyya the Lordship of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and the uh, the worship of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala alone, because seeking forgiveness is an act of worship. Seeking support and assistance can be an act of worship. In here, it's an act of worship. Uh, seeking refuge can be an act of worship, especially if these uh, acts are done from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rabbil Alameen, seeking refuge in Allah, seeking the support and assistance from Allah, seeking forgiveness from Allah. And we're going to talk about some details very shortly, uh, some of the benefits of when at times it is not ibadah. And then, as we just mentioned, when it is so, from some of the immense benefits of this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi wasallam, are the following uh, benefits. As we mentioned, that. In the beginning of the hadith, the Prophet alayhi salatu, uh, the uh, Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala, he said, Allamana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Or he said, uh, you know, Allamana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at tashahud. So this statement, which Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala said, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us this hadith illustrates for us, or this statement illustrates the hars, hars al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, alayhi salatu wa sallam ala iblaad al-risala wa hidayat al-ummah that the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was vigilant in giving the message, delivering the message and the guidance of his nation. And this faida or this benefit is taken from just that statement, Allamana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us. That means the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was, was Haris. Haris in delivering the message. He was very vigilant and he did his full job that Allah Azza wa Jalla appointed him to do Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that is delivering the message of Islam so that you and I will be guided so that mankind would be guided as is mentioned Fi Kitab Allah wa Sunnat Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the best of teachers Alayhi Salatu Wasallam another benefit of this hadith Tasmiyat al-Shay bi afdal ma jaa fihi so we already mentioned this. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is that as a principle, sometimes in the in the Sharia that you find a naming of something by its best the best name that it could be named from within the context of something else. Let's make that clear by, uh, and, and, and the example, Haytha atlaku ala hadhi al-khutbah at-tashahud. And this is illustrated by the fact that this khutbah, what we know as khutbah al haja or the, the, uh, In English, we say the uh, maybe the speech that I can't think of exactly the term we would say, but we are all familiar with khutbah that we do the khutbah on Yom Jumwa. That is for the Jumwa prayer, and so this is a speech or preaching uh, out of necessity. Okay, the meaning. Are, are not out of necessity, but to uh, that this supplication, this khutbah, these uh, series of supplications and, and praising of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is done out of, uh, for some ceremony or something which shows high importance. And for example, that's why this is in Kitab and Nikah, because of the marital, uh, the importance of the marital bond. And that this was a sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam to make this khutbah. Then, likewise, during the khutbah, uh, khutbah to Jumwa, and also along with that, and that's why we did it at the beginning of this hadith, is that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and this is the way of the ulama and the salaf, is that they would begin their books often, or their so many of their writings, and likewise their speeches with this khutbah al hajjah showing that what comes next has great importance so it's bega it began or it begins with the praising of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in alhamdulillah nahmaduhu wa nasta'inu wa nastaghfiruh so it begins with praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then asking him saying that we seek uh, you know, we seek uh, 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 your assistance. We seek your forgiveness. And we seek refuge in you from our wicked selves. So it shows the importance that what comes after that is something of, of, of grave importance or something that's serious and important. The third benefit mentioned with regards to this hadith Istihbab taqdeem hadhi al-khutbah bayna yaday al-amur al-hamm So this is what we've already discussed and that it shows that this is recommended to before you have something important like we said nikah, marriage or uh, of course the jumuah and some uh, perhaps in the beginning of your writings or the beginning of a speech that you give that this is highly recommended. Uh, and also it is known, and this is also 
uh, and, and, and this is derived from within the hadith because in the Arabic, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud referred to it as tashahud, we, as we recall, and he said, a tashahuda fil haja, that this is the tashahud regarding something that is very important. Okay? With regards to the hukum or ruling here, وَكَدَّهَبَ بَعْدُ الْعُلَمَا إِلَى وَجُوب هَذِهِ الْخُطْبَةِ So some of the scholars say that this khutbatul الْحَاجَة or تَشَهُدْ فِي الْحَاجَة is wajib, is an obligation. But it appears and Ibn Uthimeen brings his, his evidences that the most sound opinion Allah, is that it is recommended, that it is not an obligation. And one of the evidences he mentions is that someone, uh, that a, a woman, she had she had offered herself to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for marriage, which is permissible. It's permissible for a woman to say, I'm interested in you and offer herself up for marriage. And of course she needs a muhram and all the other aspects of nikah, which we'll get into as we study some of the uh, conditions for nikah and so forth. And so she offered herself to the Prophet Sallallahu and the Prophet والسلام, another man had an interest, a sahabi radiallahu ta'ala had an interest in this woman. And so the Prophet Sallallahu married her to him. And in that, he did not, as Bin Uthimeen said, وَلَمْ يَقْرَى هَذِهُ الْخُطْبَةِ So he did not read the khutbah al hajjah in that nikah. And he said, زَوَّجْتُكَ بِمَا مَعَكْ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ I have married you for what you contain from the Qur'an. And from that hadith, that shows us also that from the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not to be difficult with regards to the mahar not to be difficult with regards to the mahar. And we'll talk about that later when we get more into the ahadith in Kitab and Nikah. But the shahid, or the point of me mentioning that, is that the Prophet uh, Ben Uthaymin mentioned that the Prophet وسلم, لم يقرأ هذه الخطبة that the Prophet وسلم, when he married that sahabi to that sahabiyah that he did not read the khutbah al hajjah but rather he just said, I have married you for what you contain in the Qur'an. Meaning that whatever he hifted to the Qur'an, then that was her mahar. That was her mahar. Maybe to teach her the Qur'an. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith affirms that the praise is fully due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah tabarak wa ta'ala he has kamil sifat and alhamd is from his is uh, you know it shows the the kamil of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah tabarak wa ta'ala is perfect free from perfection and all the praise belongs to Allah alhamdulillah all the praise because when we have the alif wa lam alhamd there that makes it uh Ma'rifah, and it, it for us it affirms that we're saying, for example, the praise. So that means all of the praise it belongs to Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is perfect and he is deserving of all praise. And the ulama they mention about Alhamd wa uh Al Ethna, Ethna ala Shay. Ethna ala Shay means to to praise something. For example, Ethna Khalid al Rijal. That means Khalid, he praised this man. He praised this man. But Alhamd is restricted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we don't say Hamid Allahu ala Fulan. We don't say that. Now as far as it being permissible or not, we have to go back to the statements of the ulama, uh, the scholars of the Salaf with regards to that hukum. But in general, the Hamd is reserved for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So instead you use something else, another word, for praise, for praising a person or some something. So that means that Alhamd 
This is referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's perfection and that He is mustahik lahu. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is fully deserving of all that praise, tabarak wa ta'ala. He's the only one worthy of worship and He is worthy because of His perfection of all in 100% praise. All praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna alhamdulillah. Just as the beginning in the hadith, Inna alhamdulillah. Inna is a... Is a is a a word which refers uh, we we use it for to keep to to affirm something. So here we're saying in alhamdulillah. That means verily all the praise belongs to Allah, without exception. All the praise belongs to Allah. The next benefit, the fifth benefit of this hadith. Talaba ma'una wa maghfira min Allah wahdu. So here in this hadith, it also illustrates that uh, uh, another faida of this hadith or benefit of this hadith is that in this hadith contains the seeking or the asking for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's support and his forgiveness. So I seek or we seek uh, your assistance or your help, your support. When it's so through, and we seek your forgiveness. So then Ben Othaymin from his fiqh, he mentioned some fuwa'id and we'll just quickly go through it. He says, uh, so if a person says, how to choose isti'ana bi ghayri la, is it permissible to have isti'ana to seek the support of someone other than Allah? This is a very important question. And he says, Naam. He says, Yes. Yes. It's the Anabi Lady La is permissible. But of course, it's restricted. There are tafsil, there are details with this. What are the details? He says, Yes. If the person who you're seeking assistance from is able uh, to assist you. For example, if I'm in this room and I say, for example, as many of the, the people have went astray, they, they pray to the dead. They say, Oh, Abdul Qadir Jailani, Oh, uh, Sheikh of our tribe, Oh, Sheikh of uh, such and such order, okay, Sufi order or what have you, and they pray, they supplicate to the dead. That person who they are, or they say that we, you know, we seek your assistance, that person cannot heal, hear and help them. They cannot even help themselves. They cannot cause harm, nor can they assist. So that would be shirk. That's when it comes into ibadah. But if you're seeking the assistance of someone who is able, for example, you have a family member and you say, can you please help me? I need, I need some money or I need some assistance. Someone's trying to harm me. I need this. It's something they're able to do. They're able to fulfill that. Then that's permissible. That is not shirk and that has not, no relation with ibadah. So that's what distinguishes uh, the two, and I hope that's clear. Likewise, you can ask someone to forgive you for something. If, if it relates to their haq, for example, if I took something from someone, if I back, if I have back bitten someone, and then they say, uh, and I go to them and I say, forgive me, please. I, back, I used to back bite you. And they say, I forgive you. So I sought forgiveness from them. That has no relationship with ibadah. What is ibadah is to get the forgiveness for the sins. This, these forgiveness of the sins can only be made from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Allah, la yaghfiru an yushriku bi wa yaghfiru ma dunu dhalik li ma Verily Allah does not forgive that you commit shirk, but he forgives other than that for whomsoever he pleases, letting us know Allah is the one who forgives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives. And this is related to the forgiveness with regards to sins. And this is an act of ibadah, seeking that kind of forgiveness. And so, those are some important aspects. Then, the sixth uh, benefit of this hadith, anna isti'adha tukun billah. So when we seek refuge, the, the type of refuge that is sought, that's mentioned in the hadith, wa na'udhu billahi min shururi and fusina. And we seek refuge from our evil selves. 
we seek refuge from our evil selves. This is an act of Ivada, and this comes from Eliza with you. Likewise, the details regarding this issue, the isti'ana, uh, so likewise, it is also permissible to have, uh, or isti'ada, it is also permissible to seek refuge in other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this would be in a case which it is not ibadah. So this again, the same details being that someone is able to help you. They are, they're able to give you refuge. For example, if you sought refuge in someone uh, to assist you from being beaten by someone larger than you or whatever. You sought refuge and protection from them or whatever the case may be. But letting us know that there's a difference between uh, the ibadah, the worship, when it would be shirk to do that, with when seeking refuge in someone who has no ability for you to seek refuge in. And we mentioned some examples. Seeking refuge in the dead. Seeking refuge in someone who is living even, but they are unable, they are... Uh, a thousand miles away. For example, if you say, my sheikh in Mauritania, my sheikh in Hadramaut in Yemen, please help me, please, I seek refuge in you, then this would constitute shirk. Because he is unable to assist you. You are unable to seek refuge with him. He cannot support you. He cannot help you. He cannot give you refuge. Even if it's just by the phone. The next benefit of this hadith is this hadith also illustrates that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful to us and he's more merciful to us than we are to ourselves. And this is affirmed through the statement in the hadith وَنَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ شُرُورِ أَنفُسِنَا And I seek refuge in Allah from the evil, or we seek refuge in Allah from the evil of ourselves. So here, you have sought refuge in Allah from yourself. And this is evidence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mercy and that the refuge is sought with him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is that he, subhanahu wa ta'ala, this illustrates that he is the most merciful. And that the refuge and the support is sought with Allah Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith illustrates for us, and we, we mentioned this uh, in the beginning of the study of the hadith, that ourselves, that we ourselves, our nafs, our souls, also have an inclination towards evil. And that's illustrated when the Billah min Shururi and Fusina. That lets us know that ourselves we have evil. We contain both good and evil. We have the propensity to do evil and to overcome ourselves with evil. And likewise we have the propensity to do great good and overcome the evil with good. So that's the nature of humankind is that they have both the propensity for evil and, and good. Another benefit of this hadith is that whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed to have guidance, no one can misguide him. And that whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has left astray because of their own evil selves, no one can guide them, no matter how much they try. And this goes back to the two types of guidance, that there is the guidance of Irshad and the guidance of uh, uh, or Tawfiq. That the guidance of Irshad is like showing someone the correct way. So you can invite someone to Islam as much as you want. You may love them, your family members. As, as those of us who have non-Muslim family members, we love them. And we want them all to be guided. We want all of them to be saved from the hellfire. So you may strive, you strive, you call them to Islam, you invite them to Islam, you show them good manners, you show them the goodness of Islam, but maybe Allah doesn't guide them. 
So that that issue I just mentioned that mentioned that's two types of guidance. You showing them them this is hidayah hidayah to irshad. This is showing them the way. Hidayah to tawfiq. This is the guidance of their actually being guidance. Whether they are they have the tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa taala to accept that guidance. That their heart is changed. It's between the the fingers of Ar Rahman. It's between the, the fingers of Allah Azza wa Jal to be a, to, to have that guidance. That's from Allah uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So no one can guide if Allah has left them astray. And may Allah protect us from misguidance. I mean Rabbil Alameen. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us and which is contained in the statement Min Yahdi Allah Fala Mudillala. So whoever Allah guides, no one can lead him astray. It shows us that the mu'min uh, is concerned about their guidance, concerned about his or her guidance, and is always asking and seeking guidance from Allah Azza wa Jalla. Another benefit of this hadith is that it is an obligation upon a person to declare what's in their heart, uh, uh, what's to declare on their lisan, on their tongue, what's in their heart. Meaning when we uh, take the shahada, it's a verbal shahada, a verbal testimony of faith. So why some of the ulama, they mention that the shahada is not valid unless it is openly declared. It's openly declared unless there's some extreme situation. Someone knows about Islam and they are fearful and they're by themselves and they, you know, even then, uh, some of the ulama they mentioned that it should be the testimony should be on the tongue. They they bear witness that there's no God worthy of worship, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. And so it shows that it's not sufficient just to say on your tongue what differs within the heart. This is the sifat of, uh, of the um, this is the characteristic of the hypocrites of the munafikeen. So this uh, hadith illustrates for us because, and this is illustrated in the statement in the Khutbat al Haja when he said, Wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashadu an Muhammadan abduhu wa rasul. I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship except the law, and I bear witness that Muhammad is his last slave, is his slave and messenger. So that is a verbal testimony and of course that is witnessed in the in the heart as well that should be believed in the heart it's not just a matter of uttering this testimony of faith and then you're saved another benefit of this hadith is that Allah and this affirms for us the Tawheed as we mentioned Tawheed uh, Al-Uluhiya and Tawheed Al-Rububiya because here where you know this shows us that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who has the right to be worshipped, is the only one worthy of worship, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And everyone, everything worship besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is batil. They, they, have, they don't have this right. This hadith also illustrates for us the affirmation of the ubudiyah, uh, ubudiyah to the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, called he abduhu. So this hadith also illustrates that the Prophet ﷺ was a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is uh, illustrated, or the evidence for this is in the hadith, is when we make the testimony of faith, وَأَشَّدُوَنَّ Muhammadan abduhu is his servant or his slave. So that shows the uh, ubudiyah, the servanthood of the Prophet ﷺ. Why is that... Uh, relevant for us because by saying that the Prophet ﷺ was the servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that shows that he did not share in lordship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he did not share so we should not seek to come closer to Allah by supplicating to the Prophet ﷺ or seeking refuge in the Prophet ﷺ and all those other acts of ibadah that only go to Allah so by saying he is the abdu, ab, uh, abduhu wa that he is the slave or servant and messenger, of course you don't worship the slave. 
Of course, you don't supplicate to the slave. You supplicate to the Lord of the worlds, the Rabbil Alameen. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith affirms for us the message of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that is through the statement, as we just mentioned, the testimony of faith, faith, faith uh, Abduhu wa Rasuluhu, and his messenger. So it shows that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what? This is evidence that he was a messenger and he was the last messenger of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This hadith also illustrates for us the status of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and as a final benefit of this hadith, this hadith shows us, it affirms for us one of the sifat of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala as well, the rahmah, the mercy of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala uh, for his, his creation. And that is illustrated because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sent to it as a mercy for all of mankind. So this shows the mercy of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that he sent his messenger, his la uh, uh, last messenger, to give us the message, to tell us how to worship him, to give us guidance in this world that has so much darkness and has so much uh, misguidance and so many various paths that you could live a life, a long life, or a short life without guidance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But, but the mu'min has the guidance, and the mu'min in our time has the guidance of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. After the advent of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam, we're ordered to follow his sunnah. Salawatu Rabbi wa salamu alayhi, and we ask Allah the Almighty to guide us and bless us to be of those who follow his sunnah.